Basha is a PhD candidate at Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Her research focuses on topics such as cosmology, large-scale structures, and the early universe. Thank you so much for being here today. So Thank my you. first Thank question you. to you is, how did you decide to become an astrophysicist? What pushed you to pursue a career in this? Around the time I was in 10th grade or so, um, or beginning high school, I don't know if the grade systems is the same everywhere. Um, I started becoming very curious about like, what is everything like? What is matter? How are we here? What is space? I don't understand. And, and I don't know. Um, I didn't think philosophy was going anywhere because you don't really get any concrete answers. Um, and I always love science. So I, I started like going on Wikipedia, like, uh, what is the big bang? And like, what is the standard mar model? Like, uh, what are particles? What are subatomic particles? What is everything? And I don't know, I thought it was really, really cool. And I started reading a lot of pop science textbooks. And I was like, Oh, wow, how could anyone like, want to research anything else. This is so cool. We're studying like existence itself. Um, I knew I wanted to go into physics. I didn't around that time. That's, that's when I started to realize I wanted to go into physics. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to research in physics. I was thinking like quantum gravity type stuff, dark matter. Like I wasn't sure. I just thought it was all really cool. Um, and I think I knew I wanted to go into something akin to some sort of theoretical physics, not so much experiments, but either being able to work with theories themselves or or work with data or something like that. But in undergrad, I did um, a bachelor's in, in mathematical physics, and then I was lucky, lucky enough to get into perimeter for uh, the master's program. And I got to explore a lot of different areas of theoretical physics. Um, I really thought I wanted to go into um, quantum gravity at the time. And I worked in kind of like uh, holography for a year um, doing some research that was last year. And then I decided I wanted something a little bit more concrete, something that's a little bit more testable. Um, and so that's kind of why I decided to go into uh, cosmology slash astrophysics. I'm more on the cosmology side, but um, we work with a lot of the same data. Um, and so, yeah, that's my PhD started. I'm working, uh, it's like, it's, I'm technically a resident at Perimeter. Um, the degree granting institution is University of Waterloo. That's for pretty much everyone at Perimeter. Um, that's the same thing, because uh, Perimeter, it's not a, a degree-granting institution on its own, so all of us technically get our PhD somewhere else, but things such as cosmological expansion or matter clustering, and and what I'm using, um, the tool that I'm refining kind of centers around something called baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, I'll, I'll try not to go into too much depth. Um, because, you know, I, it's, uh, there's a lot of details, but um, um, in the early universe, right, um, photons, light particles were so energetic that they were just bumping into everything, right? And they could, they were, you know, they were bumping into a lot of matter particles, right? Uh, uh, the, the baryons we see around us, the, the physical matter that we can see. Um, and there was this kind of photon pressure, this light pressure on, on uh, matter that, that kind of pushed matter outwards a little bit, while at the same time, dark matter, the matter that doesn't interact with light, um, had a big gravitational pull on the baryons, on the physical matter. And there was kind of this tug of war between photon pressure and gravity. Um, and so in regions that had a lot of, a lot of matter, um, you had kind of 
a breaking point where where some physical matter uh got pulled away from like sort of matter cores there's some cool animations for this but it, it's really like like in parts where the universe was very dense um some of the matter around those dense areas got pulled away into like these spherical shells around these dense cores and the the pulling was from the photon pressure um but the rest stayed in the center because of gravity um and so these spheres exist in the universe right and in those spheres that surrounded these cores they were more dense and lots of galaxies sort of populated those spheres as the universe evolved um but those spheres were left in place because eventually the photons lost enough energy that they couldn't push on matter as much anymore. And so they left the spheres in place. We know roughly what size those spheres should be. And we can see those spheres um, when we point telescopes at the sky today. We can see these patterns of galaxies. And because we know how roughly how large those spheres should be, we have a kind of standardized ruler for the universe that that can tell us like okay here something's this distance something's distance and we know how large these spheres are we know how big things are in the universe and that ruler um helps us understand um the expansion of the universe and helps us understand things like you know dark energy dark matter a lot better and so my research is focused on kind of refining, I guess, computational analysis of the data that collects that we collect on these spheres. Um, and those spheres are called the baryon acoustic oscillations. It's it doesn't really look like an oscillation to us now, but um, there's some sort of historical reasons why it's called that. Um, but yeah, so my research is focused on on better understanding uh, better measuring those spheres uh which helps us measure you know expansion and and understand a lot of other things about the universe um and you said how does it maybe connect to daily life i would say my research doesn't directly connect to daily life but a lot of the tools that we use um, a lot of the galaxy surveys that we use um, do push technological advancements forward quite well, like your phone camera and other things have been improved over the years because of improvements in, um, uh, in say, uh, galaxy surveys and, and other astrophysical uh, instrumentation. Um, other than that, I mean, it's pretty important that we do this research because 95% of the energy density of the universe is completely, you know, unknown. We don't understand it. That's dark energy, dark matter. And this research helps us figure that out. And so like, you know, if, if it's pretty embarrassing, 95% of this energy density, we have no idea what it is, you know, we better, better figure that out, you know. But yeah. And the research you're doing sounds really interesting in a way, something that seems so unknown to us and you're developing tools to figure out that unknown. It's really interesting. So could you walk us through what a typical day as a PhD candidate looks like for you, if there is a typical day? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's mostly just coding. <laughs> but um, yeah, I... Uh... Generally, just I go to my desk, which is kind of a shared little office space um, uh, with a lot of people researching the same area as me. Um, and I've got my project to work on. Um, I, I try to work a little bit on it. Then I go ask questions from other people. There's lots of postdocs in the office who know a lot more than I do. And so I ask them a lot of questions um, and that helps me progress. And um, usually um, a number of times a week, it includes some, some seminars. I'll go to a seminar or two or a colloquium where 
people ex explain their research, oftentimes in uh, astrophysics, sometimes in cosmology too. Um, and yeah, that, that's about it. There's a lot of coding, a lot of asking questions, and a lot of going to seminars. Um, but I'm mostly done with classes, so so yeah, so it's mostly just research now. And there's some TAing, of course. <laughs> but, in a way, it's not really fixed. It's a mix of a lot of different things. Yeah, so, I don't really have a schedule other than meetings scheduled in. Hmm. That sounds fun. In a way, you don't really have something really rigid and it's flexible to accommodate your methods. So can you discuss any challenges you've encountered in your research and how, have you, how you've addressed them and what you've learned from facing those challenges? I'd say most of the challenges I face are bug related <laughs> in my code. Um, sometimes, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of installation issues, a lot of bug issues. Sometimes the supercomputer we work with is down. Um, um, you know, sometimes it takes me a while to understand a lot of the jargon since there's just so many layers of information that people have built on. Um, and they they'll just kind of use the jargon day to day and and you have to be like wait a second what is a power spectrum wait a second what is you know um but that's slowly being cleared up and um there's lots of people that that are around to help that's because i work um in a pretty big group there's well relatively speaking there's 10 of us in the group um about 10 and um we also a number of us work in a big collaboration called um the maybe you've heard of it the dark energy spectroscopic instrument or desi um and um and also some people are working with the euclid collaboration um that's part of the european space agency um but yeah, there's lots of people around to, to ask questions from, and it's not very lonely, surprisingly, which is, yeah. I definitely learn a lot more about um, <laughs> computers, bugs, and um, I've learned a lot of physics. I think I've learned not to be afraid to ask for help because it makes things go much faster. You just, because there's people who have been studying these things for like five years, 10 years, maybe even 30, 40 years. Um, so obviously if, if you're trying to figure something out and, and you're, you know, reading textbooks or, or you're just trying to like conceptualize it on your own, um, you could understand it much faster if you just ask the expertise of someone who's um, been doing this for so long, they can explain it better and, and elucidate and yeah. That's really true in a way. I think asking questions just makes work go faster. And one thing you said is astrophysics is not lonely. You know, it's a very collaborative effort. Where you're just working with a lot of different people, which is very different from what people usually think of this field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it depends what group you're working into. Some people, if they're very heavy theory, they might not be working with too many people. But I like working with a lot of people. So this is a bit of a different question, but what do you think makes a scientist a good scientist? Some traits of a good scientist would probably be definitely communication. That's a big thing because if you're able to communicate um, or at least try to communicate, eventually get an idea across, then, then it makes things a lot better. You can collaborate and... Usually more heads are better than, than one. But um, yeah, I think communication is a big one. Um, and it takes a while to understand um, information well enough. You know, for example, my advisor who's been working in this field for uh, far more years than me um, can explain all of these things much better because he has a better grasp. And I'd say... 
probably the drive or the motivation that comes from your curiosity about the field. If you're very curious, it helps a lot. Um, and yeah, I'd say curiosity and communication are some two really great things for a scientist. Definitely. And so are there any specific scientific mysteries or unanswered questions in astrophysics that you find particularly very interesting? I mean, there's some of the famous ones, like, like what is the nature of dark energy? That I find very interesting because, you know, some people say dark energy is just the energy that is naturally existing in space-time itself. And as space expands, there's more of this energy that drives more of the expansion. Um, and that it's just kind of this cosmological constant, that it's just constant in, in a volume of space, right? Um, but other people say, no, this, this doesn't quite match with our observations. There's certain things that don't quite make sense. You know, we think maybe it evolves over time. Maybe it's something else. But um, I think it's especially exciting because I think we're close to figuring it out. I think with all the new data coming in from DESI, from Euclid, from um, all the new, there's like a huge new influx of, of data coming in. Um, I think we'll be able to figure out if dark energy is something that's constant or if it's evolving in time. And I think that's really interesting because it will determine, you know, which theories will hold out and which theories won't. Um, I think we're getting closer on the dark matter front. Um, I think people have been saying that for a long time, but fingers crossed. <laughs> Um, other than that, there's two, in cosmology, there's, there's these two, two kind of issues that we've been having that, that relate to the dark matter and the dark energy picture. Maybe you've heard of them before. One is called the Hubble tension. Have you heard of that before? Yeah. So the Hubble tension, I guess for those who don't know, who might watch this, the Hubble tension, um, is we have this parameter, this variable that we, that, that tells us um, what is the expansion rate of the universe and different measurements get different results. And people have taken more and more and more measurements and the measurements largely fall into two camps. Um, and they're, they're very similar to each other. Like um, they're, they're not that far apart, but, but, the more measurements people have taken, the more it's become clear that there's just these these two groups of of you know some people saying the universe is expanding at this rate, or some people are saying the universe is no, it's expanding a little bit faster, um, and it's very interesting to see whether that comes from systematic errors. Is there just is there just, you know, um, are we making poor assumptions when we're, when we're taking these measurements or is there new physics there? Um, and then another one is actually another like measurement problem that comes into two, two camps uh, of, of measurement and that has to do with matter clumping. Um, and some people say, okay, matter clumps a little bit more. Some people say, okay, matter clumps a little bit less. And there's so many measurements that support each of them and not too many falling like in the middle or maybe there's some, but um, it would be very cool to figure that out as well. And then once we understand that, maybe, maybe if really there's a reason why, you know, maybe early universe measurements say, the universe was expanding at this rate and later universe measurements say the universe was expanding at this rate, then maybe it means um, we understand something else about dark energy. Maybe it changed over the course of the universe. And that's, that's really cool. But... In a way, you talked about how different op uh, measurement tools can affect your results. So is that in a way 
reflects how what we understand about your theory is in a way flawed because if you're getting different results with different tools, then does it reflect that our understanding of the topic lacks to not be able to reach a conclusion in it? That's a good question. And um, we're still unsure because like, okay, yes, in the sense that maybe our assumptions were wrong and maybe there isn't this discrepancy in the measurement. Maybe if we correct our assumptions, all the measurements will converge. So yes, but also yes in the other sense of maybe our assumption that about dark energy itself is flawed and if we have a better theory of it then it'll explain why maybe early there was early dark energy and it's different from late dark energy or something like that um but yeah so actually i'd, I'd say yes to both cases like like we either have to figure out either our assumptions, our theoretical assumptions are wrong um, in terms of, in, in some sense, like in the sense of, of, of just like, you know, are Cepheids the same in all areas of the universe? Is that true? Or is our assumption about dark energy wrong? So, yeah. Yeah. Really interesting in a way. I think physics is really weird in a way that there's still so much unknown and things keep changing all the time in this field, which makes it so interesting to study. Um, so how do you stay updated on the latest adv advancements that's going on, all the research that's happening? How do you stay in touch with all of that? Um, so a lot of people read archive um, um, you know, where all the, the papers, all the physics papers are pre-printed. Um, I, you know, I've sometimes look at archive, but mostly it's through word of mouth and going to seminars and also, um, being part of a big collaboration. We often have telecons where we, we, you know, we have like a little zoom call or something like that, um, weekly and people discuss um, different advancements within the collaboration, but they might bring up something else too. Um, so I think just being in the loop with a lot of people helps quite a bit. And if you're, if you're less around lots of people who are studying the same thing, then reading archive is, is a valuable too. It again becomes about collaborating and networking with people as much as you can. Um, finally, what do you think is the best part of studying astrophysics? I think my favorite part would be learning new things with other people. Um, I think I have a lot of fun when, when I finally understand something that I really had no idea about before. Um, I think it's, it's really cool when other people help you learn things and yeah, I'd say that's my favorite part. I'd say learning new things with other people. That's really nice. Um, thank you so much, Vacha. It was really interesting to hear your different research, how you learn astrophysics and your journey so far. It was awesome for me to hear about it. And I hope my audience also gained a lot from this conversation.